Hi everyone and welcome to episode 93 of SAMA, a program which invites an expert to talk about their area of expertise. This week we are delighted to have Dr. Joel Furman to talk about advances in natural nutrition science to resolve high blood pressure, diabetes and heart disease naturally. Joel is a board certified family physician, nutritional researcher and six time New York Times best-selling author. He has authored numerous research articles which are published in medical journals <laughs> and is on the faculty of Northern Arizona University Health Science Division. His two most recent books are Eat to Live Quick and Easy Cookbook. That's my kind of book. It's got the word easy in it. And Fast Food Genocide. He is currently serving as the president of the Nutritional Research Foundation. It's fantastic to have you on our show, Joel. Um, Welcome to SAMA. Thank you. Great to be here. So, um, okay, I'll, I'll fire with the question that's on everybody's minds. Um, how can the study of nutrition help with conditions which are so serious, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, and, blood, um, and heart disease? Well, those are predominantly diseases of nutritional ignorance, and they don't occur in people eating an ideal or optimized diet style. So they're demonstrative of the fact that the modern diet that people eat in America, in the world today, even we spread you know, food, bad eating all over the globe, is not well suited for the human species. Because if we eat a diet that's ideally suited for the human species, heart disease doesn't occur. Not only that, we feed people an ideal, idealized nutritional program there can be no type two diabetes and no strokes and no heart attacks and we'd win the war on cancer. We'd hardly see any cancers occurring as well. So what I'm saying right now is that nutritional science has advanced to the point where we can pretty much wipe out all these health crises and save billions of lives across the world, have people extend their life with better healthy life expectancy, which means enjoying their life in their later years and not being sick and medically dependent. And so and nobody's taking advantage of these advances in nutritional science. Right. So you've touched on a very good point, because it's not just the longevity, it's the quality of the length of life as well. Because there's no, no point living a you know, long life and spending half of that in bed or being in pain. That's right. I call it, that's normally referred to as not just lifespan, but health span. <laughs> and we're also talking about, about play span. You ever hear that term play span? It means we like to play and do things that are fun. And what good is living longer if you can't still do things you enjoy in life and have fun in your life? So we want to stay alive so we can have more fun with our full mental faculties intact. You know, so this is why, you know, so I coined a word uh, and the word is nutritarian. A nutritarian is somebody who eats foods knowing that it's going to protect them against later life diseases. So it's a diet rich in a full portfolio of nutrients that humans need to maximize their health and longevity. Wow. Before we start digging into that, I noticed that you're very, very passionate in this subject. You're not just an expert, but you've made it almost like a, a life goal to educate people and to make a big change. How did this all start? Why did you get so interested in nutrition? Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I'm incredibly passionate about this. It's just, you know, it, it's exciting to watch people be able to get well. And there's so much needless tragedy around the world. So many people going into, you know, having strokes and being put in a nursing home or, or having to go on dialysis or losing their brains and becoming demented or having to deal with the effects of cancer. You know, nobody, nobody has to have these things happen. I'm extremely passionate about this. I mean, I, I started reading books on health and nutrition in my um, early teens, yes. probably when I was 10 or 11 years old, I got into it. And my wow. father was overweight and sickly, and I started, I was on the United States World Figure Skating Team. I was a competitive figure skater. I was actually third in the world in pairs figure skating with my sister in 1976. Wow, that's, that's quite an achievement. Yeah, and so I was, you know, reading books on nutrition just for my own personal um, stamina or whatever and 
not to get sick. But my father, of course, was a major factor in me in being interested in nutrition because he was so sickly and he was looking to read books to help his own health. And I started reading all those books with him and I started learning all about it too. And I started, I became very fascinated by it. You know, eventually went to medical school with the specific intent of being a physician that was going to utilize aggressive nutritional methods to help people get well, as opposed to just popping pills. You know, I used to always say, um, you know, how does anybody think that taking a poison is going to give them health? You know, pharmaceutical drugs are poisonous. The first thing we learn in medical school in the first pharmacology lecture is that all drugs are toxic and we want to live in a manner to have to avoid taking them if we can. That's what we learned the first day in medical school is they're poisonous. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that it never, you know, it's like you're hitting yourself with a hammer really hard on your hand and causing a tremendous injury there. Yes. And then you're going to a doctor and taking pain medication for it. But the next day you come home, you whack yourself in a hammer again. <laughs> You know, so you, and you take another pain medication and you give yourself another whack. Yes. All the medication, you know, so it's like what I'm saying is that the modern frankenfoods, the diet most people eat is, is the hammer. And we're killing ourselves day in and day out by eating foods not well adapted to our species design. And we're trying to now go to doctors to take drugs. And the drugs enable us. They're the enablers. In other words, they enable you. to. If when you have high blood pressure and you go to a doctor and it gives you a drug to lower that, that drug enabled you to keep on the same diet because now it lowered your blood pressure and you think you're okay, you're not okay. And the same diet that caused the high blood pressure is going to inevitably cause the problem to, re to keep continuing to develop and get worse. When you take your drug, if we never had drugs for high blood pressure, high cholesterol and diabetes, then people would be forced to lose the weight, start eating vegetables and, and, eating, and start exercising more, but living on foods that were going to get their... their um, their weight and their blood pressure down. I, I have to say right now that the most proven methodology to slow aging and to extend human life, moderate caloric restriction in an environment of micronutrient excellence. So we're talking about this concept of micronutrient excellence and eating lots of green vegetables because they're the highest in micronutrients per calorie of all foods. And, that, and, and the effect of, that green vegetables have to extend human lifespan. And I always say we've landed the man on the moon already, which means we know how to, what it means is that we already know how to prevent cancer and live longer. But people don't like the answer we found. They're looking for a different answer. <laughs> they want a magic pill that they could take and still smoke cigarettes and not get lung cancer. They mm -hmm. want to still eat burgers and fries and, mm -hmm. and meat, barbecue, and, you know, and they and bread and pasta and, and, and um, croissants and donuts. They want to continue to eat junk food and, not, and, not, and still not get cancer. It can never happen. It's not a fairy tale. This is the real world and you are what you ate in life. You, your health is what is the quality of the food you put in your body. That's what your health is. Right. When you look at the diets of the countries of the world, um, the, what I've noticed and what other people have seen is there's a tendency of the types of food gravitating, gravitating to that of the Western diet and predominantly of the American diet. Now, if I look at a vitamin um, container, I don't see Mac something in the list of the <laughs> ingredients. And yet we've got large corporations expanding out, franchising to different countries, and China here is no different. We have the large American fast food places. Why do you think it is that America is like a leading light for bad eating habits? Well, it's all about um, making money with these major corporations. It's all about they're trying to get people addicted to these Franken foods that make you addicted and make you sick. So a lot of, there are some smarter countries, um, the, some of the countries um, or that I've been to, like I think it was the Bahamas that had me speaking to the Ministry of Health and they were trying to um, educate their population is not to eat fast food and not to eat American junk food and processed foods, to eat foods grown there and eat fruits and vegetables and beans and nuts and stay away from the temptation to be eating Franken foods that have been designed to get people hooked like drugs. Right. In other words, what if we spread cocaine all over the world to try to get people hooked on cocaine or heroin? 
Well, it's a money-making scheme for people to make money selling drugs. They want people to get hooked on drugs, the people who are making money in the drug industry, right? Right. Well, well, well having Kentucky Fried Chicken and, and all these, these fried foods and, and barbecue and French fries and foods cooked in oil, it's getting people hooked on, on, you know, on addictive type substances. And sugar is addictive. And white high and, and things fried in oil become addictive. And these things are hard for, and it takes over your brain because it, it makes you want to, your brain just doesn't feel well unless it overeats calories, especially these high, very foods that are very rapidly absorbed into the bloodstream. What I'm saying right now is that these high glycemic carbohydrates like honey and maple syrup and sugar and white flour and white rice are, are such a, have a glycemic profile that where so much glucose rubs into the bloodstream and that affects brain function. It makes you want to overeat calories and it doesn't supply you with the nutrients and fiber you need to suppress your apostat and give you and put you in right connectivity with the amount of calories you need. And then on the other hand, we have these animal products that are now being fried and barbecued and cooked and flame broiled. And we're, we're taking animal products and cooking them in a way to create heterocyclic amines and nitrosamino compounds and, and various top carcinogenic substances from the way they're served in these restaurants. But see, animal products, what I'm also saying is that a piece of chicken is just like a piece of, like a piece of white bread. A piece of chicken and a white bread are similar because neither one contains a significant load of phytochemicals and antioxidants. They're micronutrient barren. When you eat, so animal products don't contain protective micronutrients and neither do these processed foods. It's the colorful plants that are high in micronutrients. And the most protective plant foods in each category, which I, is this acronym G-BOMBS, G-B-O-M-B-S. Greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. G-bombs, greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. Like cruciferous green vegetables like cabbage and bok choy and kale and collards and, you know, and arugula. And, and then the beans like, you know, like black beans and azuki beans and red beans and lentils and split peas and soybeans. So it's eating beans. And then, of course, we're talking about mushroom, cooked mushrooms. Are there onion, onions and leeks and scallions have tremendous anti-cancer effects. Berries and, and low glycemic fruits. And, of course, last but not least, these seeds that have powerful effects against cancer, like, ses like sesame seeds and flax seeds and chia seeds. Mm -hmm. When we put a dietary portfolio together that checks every box of the promotes anti-cancer anti longevity promoting foods, then of course the body's miraculous self-healing properties get fully manifest. We really get the self-healing potential and it suppresses your appetite. You don't want to overeat calories anymore because your body's getting well nourished and because fiber affects your apostat in your hypothalamus and your central nervous system is affected by a high fiber intake. It makes you want to, makes you comfortable eating less calories. So what I'm saying is once you optimize the micronutrient fiber intake, it's very, it becomes very difficult to overeat and you don't want to overeat anymore. And of course your diabetes can go, can melt away. And America's got a very large farming community, huge farming, and a lot of it is, is good farming too. It's, it's not done, um, it's, uh, done, it's been made done in a, in a healthy way. And it seems like that's not the, um, those farmers aren't being supported as they should be. It's, everything's all done with um, crops which are designed to tolerate glyphosate, for example, so that they can spray the poisons on. What are your recommendations to people on the best sources of where to buy produce, seeds, sprouts? Right, well, I say what you're getting at is that a lot of the price subsidies for yes. American farmers goes to, goes to fuel the foods that they, that they either can make them cheap to make fast food out of. Correct. And of course, it's like corn and soy and wheat and oats, these on... Um, these, you know, these, and they they use the Roundup on them, so they can have the you can spray the weed killer on them, and they use the genetically modified foods. So there's more glyphosate in the in the food itself. It's like, is it? There's nothing yeah. good that you said. And and we don't and our, and the, the government doesn't subsidize the fruit and vegetable growers. They don't subsidize the people growing broccoli and kale. Yes. yes. They, 
Yes. And the so subdivisions like, cabbages, right? Mm, mm, mm. So right. they, they you know, so we really have so it keeps it keeps animal products like meat and chicken cheaper. You know, and it keeps the you know, it keeps I guess oil and soybean oil and cottonseed oil and and um I don't know, corn oil cheap too. You know, the oil consumption in this country has gone up a thousand fold since you know, 150 years ago. Yeah. You know, and, and, and people pour oil on their food. And in China, they pour oil on their food too. Sorry, and and the, the biggest scam ever perpetrated on the world's population was convincing people that oil is healthy from, for them. And oil is, is it's like straight calories. It's 120 calories per tablespoon. And it has no redeeming qualities. No, it has no fiber. It has no antioxidants and phytochemicals. You're just getting, makes people get fat. And I'm saying right now that cooking your vegetables and, and pouring oil over your food, which makes for extra calories and makes you get heavier, is a major cause of cancer. Because fat cells, when you're fatter, you're at a higher risk of cancer. And oil makes you get fat. So the oil makes you get fat. The fat makes you more insulin resistant. So the insulin resistance makes your pancreas poop out and make you become more diabetic. At the same time, fat cells produce inflammatory compounds like cytokines that, 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 make that, in, that promote aromatase, which makes you produce more estrogen, and you, which increases your risk of breast and prostate cancer. And you also produce angiogenesis promoters from the fat cells that make, because fat cells produce um, chemicals that, say, that, that ask the body to produce blood vessels to inc increase the growth of fat. So fat cells and insulin perpetuate their own growth by the growth of fat of the new blood supply. And tumors demand that blood supply too. So by secreting angiogenesis motors to allow blood vessels to grow, it allows tumors to grow as well. So the growth of fat promotes the growth of tumors that are not fat. You know, so we're saying that anything that makes people get fat is going to increase the growth, the growth of tumors and cancer. And so we're saying heart disease and strokes and obesity and diabetes are linked to cancer because the same dietary modalities cause both. So I'm saying right now that eating fried rice and pouring oil over white rice and then salting it is, a, is going to exacerbate and speed up a person's life accelerate their aging process and increase the risk of both diabetes and cancer. You throw some animal products on that too, like a little processed meats or, or you know, or barbecue meats or, or, or broiled meats and you make things even worse. Mm. The only, you know, so we really got to, most of what people eat in the modern world today is dangerous. We have to be living on salads, you know, veg, raw vegetables and vegetable bean soups and fresh fruits and walked Vegetable dishes that you walk different vegetables in water, quarter cup of water, put it in a wok and a broccoli and onion and mushrooms and snow pea pods and water chestnuts and ca cabbages and you walk that in a wok and then you put a sauce on top. You shut the flame off, turn a little sauce on it. The sauce can be made from nuts and seeds, which could be something like, um, you know, water with some um, almonds or hemp seeds or something with some lemongrass paste or a date or some. Um, you know, some turmeric or cumin or different spices. You make a delicious sauce for it with, you know, with vegetables. You don't pour a, a ton of oil on it. You put, you make the sauce healthy. In other words, we have the techniques. We have the delicious recipes designed. We know exactly how we can make people live to be 100 years old in great health. But very few people around the world are taking, care, are taking advantage of it because they're still eating oil, fried foods, processed foods, and mostly animal products. In other words, in America... 60% of the American diet now is processed foods, like pasta and bread and salad oils and donuts and cookies and crackers and rice cakes and bars and chips and, and breakfast cereals. That's 60% of what people eat. And another 30% are animal products. And animal products and processed foods don't contain phytonutrients. It's the vegetables and the plants, that the, the natural plants we don't eat that have to be at least 90% of our diet if we're going to reach our normal lifespan, our potential for our lifespan. Right. Now, you're, you've painted... All fats with a, um, you know, with, with one brush. Are all fats unhealthy in that regard? Fats well, let me ask you a question. Which do you think is healthier? Sesame seeds or sesame oil or walnuts or walnut oil? Which do you think has more nutrients 
and is better at promoting longevity, the whole nutter seed or the oil extracted from the nutter seed? Which do you think is better? <laughs> I always go for the whole, the whole ones. I go back to the bake basis, yeah. Right, because the fiber, the sterols, the stanols, the flavonoids, you know, you, the, the, nutter, the, the whole food can't be replicated. It's an amazing, intricate design to promote human health. In other words, how, whoever thought that, that, you know, that eating olive oil is better than eating an olive? Where did this come into people's heads that eating sesame seed oil is better than sesame seeds or soybean oil is better than a soybean? It's insanity that people believe this nonsense. Of course it's better to eat the whole food. So when you're saying good fats are bad fats, yeah, the good fats are eating the sesame seeds and the walnuts. There's cancer, can anti-cancer substances in there. But if we take that food and we throw all the fiber away and just take the oil out of it, it's just fattening and you all took all the good stuff and you threw it away. You follow what I'm saying? It's not, the, it's not the fat, it's whether you're eating a processed food or a whole food. It's like telling me to eat the sugar from an apple or eat the whole apple. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, it's a very, very good point. Okay, and I'll have a look at the, uh, there's two questions that have come through, so I'll, I'll get these other ideas. Uh, from, one from Marcus Schmidt, he's asked um, that he's got a seven-month-old son, he's trying to decide which foods to introduce him to, uh, to avoid the, the modern Western diseases <laughs> from the beginning. Isn't that great? He's, he's wanting to start from the very beginning with healthy foods for his child. So um, what, what sort of foods would you recommend? to a child of, or a baby of seven months old? To, to the same food the parents should eat. a matter of fact, if they have the healthiest baby, you want the breastfeeding mother, the, the nursing mother, yes. to be eating the same foods that she's feeding the baby while they're nursing. In other words, because the mother's eating those foods. Let's say the mother's eating quinoa and carrots and broccoli and sunflower seeds. Let's just say quinoa, broccoli, carrots, and sunflower seeds. Yes. Now she's feeding the baby. She's breastfeeding, and through the breast milk, the baby's gonna get the antibodies to those foods. Yes. So when the baby is fed the carrots, the quinoa, the broccoli, and the sunflower seeds, the baby's not gonna develop allergies to those foods because the mother had, are eating those foods at the same time the baby's being fed those foods. So the, so the healthiest thing for the baby is for the mother to eat healthy and to feed the baby the same foods the mother's eating. That's right. the way the body's been designed to function, to develop. You follow me? I'm, I'm picking that you're a fan of uh, processed baby foods as well, but we won't touch on that. There's a question from Roger um, Simler. He's um, asking what your th thoughts are on vitamin K2 to clean out blocked arteries. Now, blocked arteries is, of course, one of the modern era diseases which have come about through bad disease, uh, through bad choices in diet, <laughs> dietary needs but if you could just um well you're not going to clean out clogged arteries by taking k2 okay. that's like a dream in the of, of fantasy that you think you could take a pill and your arteries going to clean out that's that's completely nonsensical you may the lack of vitamin k could increase the risk of heart disease but once you have heart disease i mean the processed foods and all these animal products you can't expect a vitamin pill to clean out your arteries the only way to clean out your arteries is to become thin right? Lower your body fat for a male below 15%, for a female below 25% of body fat. That means your BMI has to be below 23 to get yourself to eat less calories and to eat mostly vegetables. You know, eat the vegetables with a an half an ounce of nuts or seeds twice a day. Have an ounce to an ounce and a half of nuts and seeds for fat. Eat mostly vegetables. Have a big salad, a bowl of vegetable bean soup for lunch and a piece of fruit. And for dinner, to have a, a bowl of wok mixed vegetables that are cooked in water with a nut-based sauce and, a, and, a, and some raw vegetables with a hummus dip or a salsa dip or, you know, in other words, for breakfast, have a green smoothie or have some, or have a, some quinoa with berries and it would, you know, with berries and, and um, fresh fruit cut in it with some flax seeds. In other words, eat up the perfect diet, undershoot your caloric needs so you're losing weight if you're overweight you're losing weight at least a pound or every two days, or no, you're losing at least a kilogram a week. If you're a nutritarian, you're at your ideal weight, which is thin. Or if you're a nutritarian and didn't get there yet, you're losing weight at a kilogram per week. If you're not losing weight at a kilogram per week and you're overweight, then you're not gonna reverse your heart disease and you're not gonna be healthy because fat cells produce dangerous 
factors and inflammatory compounds unless you lose weight at that rate. So you can be healthy a little bit if you're still overweight if you're losing weight towards that ideal weight. So if you're not losing a kilogram a week, you're not on a healthy diet if you're overweight. You follow me? Mm. It's quite a, quite a steep decline in weight though, isn't it? A kilo a week. It's quite a big drop. That's right. <laughs> so um, If you have heart disease and you want to get well, you have to eat so healthfully that you lose a kilogram a week. Okay. If you're not going to be eating so healthfully that you're losing a kilogram a week, you're not likely going to reverse your heart disease. Right. Unless so, you're already at your ideal weight. You know, unless you got to your ideal weight. Okay. And once you're at your ideal weight, how does your body remove plaque that it's, that's in your arteries? Well, how does your body burn fat out of your tissue? Your body needs calories. Yes. And if you're undershooting your caloric needs, the body will take your fat off and, extent, and start to remove cholesterol and plaque from inside the blood vessels for caloric sustenance. So we have to undershoot our caloric needs to reverse heart disease because heart disease is like a tumor. It's like a fatty tumor and your body has to be able to utilize that fatty tumor for energy. And so we have to, and we have, to have a lot of anti-inflammatory substances in food because your body lays down plaque to coat the inflamed wall of the blood vessels. So when we have a lot of, so we, it's a combination of the lack of antioxidants that causes increases inflammation. And also when you eat animal products like meat and chicken and fish, the higher level of animal protein increases the level of a toxin called TMAO. TMAO, trimethylamine oxide, which is a byproduct from the gram-negative bacteria, from the bacteria that grow in your gut from eating all these animal pro high animal protein foods. So we have to be on a diet where the body gets its protein from plants, not from animal products. That's why we eat nuts, we eat seeds, we eat quinoa, we eat green vegetables, we eat beans. You know, we, we, we eat foods that are, have plant proteins, not animal protein, because the animal proteins drive up these hormones that promote heart disease and drive up, of course, these toxins that inflame the um, endothelium, the lining of the blood vessels, and which increases the deposition of plaque. So the combination between reducing inflammation, flooding the body with nutrients so you have no oxidized LDL. We want the LDL cholesterol to completely unoxidize, to be not, not be oxidized. It's oxidation of LDL that's the bad actor here. And combine the, the, the removing the oxidized LDL with a carefully designed plant-based diet in conjunction with the st steady weight loss by undershooting your caloric needs melts away heart disease. Okay. Now, through the discussion we've had so far, you're not painting meat in a good light. You're, 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 um, are you a vegetarian? Yes, um, I, yes. I, my diet is almost 100% healthy, natural plant foods. Plant foods. Right? I, I, I almost rarely ever have an animal product. But I think a person can eat some animal products, a small amount, a few times a week, and still be healthy. Yes. But if you eat large amounts of animal products, it's impossible, it's impossible to be healthy. If you're eating at every meal, eating some animal products, you can't have good health. It's impossible. They're right. too pro-inflammatory, and they raise growth hormones that, that are permissively permit cancers to develop. And we know that the scientific literature is conclusive here that diets high in animal protein increase cardiovascular death and cancer death. Right. Is that because of the modern processing, or it's always been this way? No, it's not the modern processing. It's, the, it's inherently when you eat a lot of animal products, it's the excess protein produces the body. The body makes then increase growth hormones in the excess protein, and growth hormones promote aging of the brain and permissively permit angiogenesis and permit tumors to reclaim the blood supply. And plus the gram-negative bacteria, like I said earlier, produce the TMAO that inflame the brain and cause dementia and inflame the endothelium, the blood vessel lining that allowed that increased the deposition of atherosclerosis and animal products have no antioxidants and processed foods have no and white rice that we can make healthy food taste great. Yes. We've had, 30, I've had 30 years of making the most delicious recipes out of the healthiest foods on the planet and people can have the most delicious diet and still eat and still not have cancer and not get strokes and not get demented and not have heart attacks. Yes. So this is really, these, the, the nutritional science is an incredible blessing, enable us to live healthier and longer than ever before in human history. 
because we have foods we can get from all, all times of the year. We can have access to green vegetables all year long. We can have wild blueberries and, and all kinds of low sugar fruits, and we can have mushrooms, and we, we have access to these foods we didn't have availability to get years ago that enable us to live a very long, healthy life. Right. Um, of course, you've got to be careful with the foods that you're eating. For example, here in China, we have strawberries, which last on a shelf for a year and a half <laughs> without refrigeration. <laughs> they, slightly... But they must dust them with fungicides. Yeah, you, can you get organic vegetables? Um, you, you can get frozen strawberries, I'll bet, over there that don't have the fungicides on them. Yeah, but when you freeze, don't you lose many of the nutrients? Though, John? No, the freezing is okay because it locks a lot of nutrients in. You're better off having frozen than a, than a strawberry that's treated with a fungicide and can sit on the shelf for three, two weeks without getting mold on it. You're better off having the frozen because the frozen doesn't treat it with a fungicide. Now, these strawberries are so perfect looking. It's more than just a fungicide. It's, they've been bred. They've been altered. I'm sure of it. <laughs> and so you've got oh. to be very, very careful with the source. So you can actually reverse very serious conditions by setting the terrain for your body um, correctly right. with the foods that you eat. That's right. It's, it's so certainly, I'm a, certainly, I hope that you know you can get organically grown foods over there in China too. Can you get foods without pesticides and without herbicides and fungicides if you paid extra for them? It's difficult. Um, in fact, I live in Nanjing, which is a quite a large city, and now I haven't found any shop which sells organic, but we do have our villages surrounding the city which do self-grow and they use proper seeds and they don't spray so that's what we use but even right. you, can have, you must have like farmers markets or some place you can go out to the where the farmers will sell directly from the farm and sell to people uh kind of kind of similar kind of similar like that um but of course the big problem which is all you know quite prevalent here is the pollution and so we've got Water which has come, which has passed, rainwater which has passed through this pollution, on, landed on the ground, the ground's polluted as well. And the produce, you'd buy an apple, and the apple looks great, but it's layered with dust. <laughs> dust, you know, this brown dust, and you think, well, what is this? It's industrial. And you can't really get around that. So, of course, when you buy apples or any produce, you've got to peel it. But when you peel something, you're losing a lot of the nutrients and the fibres. When you when you remove the skin, right? So well, there's, no, there's no easy answer. We I do. well at least the roots of trees and the plants filter filtered um, chemicals and filter toxicity out of the soil and the fruits and vegetables and nuts that the plant produces are cleaner and 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 so. But you're right. If it's the skin, if they're spraying things on the skin, you got to wash that with soap. You know the soapy solution to get anything off there if you can. If you scrub it with soap. It's probably going to get much. You're probably okay with eating the skin. Okay, okay, right. Now, I'll ask you some questions, where, which I kind of know where where the, <laughs> the answer is going to be. But well, these these are questions which have been asked. Now, is it better to um, address health concerns through diet or through medication? <laughs> okay. Well, I always tell people that when you go to doctors and get medications, they're enabling you. I call the prescription pad a permission pad because here what this medication does, it makes you think you're okay and you're not okay. Yes. It's like, it's like sweeping the dirt under the rug and covering it up again. So your blood pressure looks okay, but your blood vessels didn't, become, didn't regain their elasticity. They're still, and now you think you're okay, so you're keeping the same diet that caused the problem to begin with. And we know in a lot of the Asian countries they have, they're eating much too much salt too, even yes. if they might be eating more vegetables, and they're still eating a huge amount of salt. And so it enables people, so you're taking drugs so you can still eat salt? If we never had the drugs, and doctors would say, start eating vegetables, cut out the salt and the oil and the sugar, and just eat plain fruits and vegetables and beans and nuts with nothing on them, and I'll see you in two weeks when you drop 10 pounds and your blood pressure's down. <laughs> now we give you a pill to so keep poisoning yourself with food, yeah. right? So the pills make people, the pills themselves are toxic, but the whole concept of giving people a drug is toxic too. 
because it enables people permissively to think they're okay when they're not, and they keep eating the same diet that caused the problem to begin with, so it has to get worse. Right. A question has come through from Carmela Walker. She's asking about salted fish, for example, salmon. Is that okay? No. Salt causes microvascular hemorrhaging. In other words, salt just doesn't raise your blood pressure. It weakens your endothelium, the lining of your blood vessels. It sets the stage for hemorrhagic stroke. In other words, if your blood, your blood pressure is going to rise with aging when you're eating a high salt diet. Mm -hmm. And we know that we're eating, that they're adding salt almost all over the world in dangerous amounts. Sure. But then the salt doesn't just raise your blood pressure. It also weakens the lining of your blood vessel. So now when you have high blood pressure, it can create the blood vessel could burst open and cause a hemorrhage. And then you are in a nursing home the rest of your life or you're dead. Right. Why do you salt why, is dangerous, you know? Why do you think um, countries don't, I mean, the people in, um, in the heads of state, they must know or have consultants who know of the, um, the long-term risks of bad food. Why are they supporting these industries which give people which, uh, yeah, a poor quality of life and early death? And that's kind of like a political question, but I can't for the life of me understand why. If, if something can be addressed easily um, through natural means, why support industries which do it in, by other means? And don't tell me it's money. It can't, it can't be just money. It must be something else. Because a politician... Well, those industries are very powerful in the United States. We have lobbyists and we have people put a lot of money to influence government and we have the biggest... Um, influence on government, the drug industry and the food industry, the two biggest money that contribute the most money to try to tell, con to control the politicians through lobbying efforts. Right. Um, look at the World Health Organization has already classified red meat and processed meat as a class 1A carcinogen. It already tells people, the World Health Organization tells people, eat mostly fruits and vegetables and beans, right? They tell people, eat mostly plants, don't eat processed foods. You know, we have a lot of the leading nutritional research organizations in the world today are telling people to eat a healthier diet, but the population is not doing it. You know, so we, but we can't expect our governments to fix things. We have to fix things ourselves. We have to learn ourselves and do what we should do, and we have to educate our populations in the, in the school systems. It should be reading, writing, arithmetic, and nutritional science. We've got to teach our population how what they put in their mouth controls their health destiny. And this is the major factor guiding their happiness and their health in life. Okay, education. If someone decides to purely eat vegetables, be it through um, moral decision, taking lives, or through health decisions, are there any nutrients which they will be deficient in? Yes, if you're on a completely vegan diet, you have to be... To, to modify your nutritional intake, to optimize your health and longevity, you have to make sure you take adequate B12, number one. The, sec the other two nutrients that can be low on a vegan diet are DHA and EPA, which are the kind of the oils or the fats you get from eating seafood, right? But you can, if you're on a vegan, you can buy those now through vegan sources. You can get vegan EPA and DHA made from algae if you want to stay on a completely vegan program. Oh, no. And then, of course, the other thing is zinc, because zinc could be moderately low on a vegan diet, and you can help your intake, you can help your, your overall health tremendously as you age if the zinc intake is adequate. Right, right. Do you ever snack? Oops. What's that? Sorry, I, 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 must, I might have interrupted you. I, I lost your audio. The question was, do you ever snack? Do I ever snack? I try, not, I try not to recreationally eat. Try not to snack, right? We want to most eat when we're hungry and not eat when we're not hungry because obviously um, extending the catabolic window at night, making sure we're resting when we're, when we're, we're not supposed to be digesting food when we're resting at night. So trying to, end the, trying to eat a dinner earlier and not eat after dinner and just have that big window of no food coming in at night extends our lifespan. We shouldn't be eating all day and all night long. We should eat in a window of like eight hours or 
10 hours, so we have at least 14 hours of no feeding during the, you know, going to bed on an empty stomach, and don't keep putting food in your mouth all night long. Right, right. Now, early on during this discussion, you were using the word addiction. Addiction to certain types of food. That's a very, very strong word. Do you think it's a true physiological addiction that people have developed to the foods which you're talking about, which were fats and sugars? Fried foods? Absolutely. A true Absolutely. It's actually a proven phenomenon that when people eat a lot of concentrated calories, it signals like a lot of oils and sugars, you know, high glycemic carbohydrates that flood into the body very rapidly. That, that it signals dopamine signaling in the brain. Like I said, if you took an opiate or snorted cocaine or took a um, narcotic, and over time you become dopamine insensitive and you require more food to get the same stimulation. Yes, food can be addicting. And when your diet is low in nutrients, um, that addictive nature of food can cause you to feel withdrawal with depression. And withdrawal shakes and fatigue, you try to come off the junk food and you don't feel well. And you only feel well if you over eat calories now. Because you, your, your body starts to detox. Yes. And detox is uncomfortable. It's like the detox from drugs. You come off cocaine or cigarette <laughs> and you feel very itchy and irritable. And the same thing when people come off their junk food diet. Oh they feel poorly. So they have to constantly overstimulate themselves. I think that, that um, for a lot of people, the, the difficulty to change their diet has to do with the addictive nature of the processed foods, the franken foods, the fast foods that they've been eating and inappropriately eating. Right, right. That's pretty scary. I think if people were following your advice, I think the hospitals will be empty. <laughs> be, you know, it'd be pretty barren anyway. Now, we've talked about diet. Let's talk a little bit about exercise. Now, what would you recommend as a regular daily activity for exercise, because you look pretty trim, and I'm assuming that you do some sort of activities, maybe not figure skating anymore, but um, well, who knows? I do exercise regularly, that's true. Yes. I, I think exercise is important. You know, the, the, the factors that increase your longevity proteins to make you live a long time, and the longevity proteins we're talking about are CERT1 and AMP kinase, or two longevity proteins. And they're, they're, they're excited or they're supported by, by caloric restriction. But that means not eat, eating a light dinner and going to bed so you have a long window at night of no food. They're encouraged by regular exercise. And of course, they're encouraged by high phytochemical foods like green vegetables and tomatoes and berries and things like that. So it's the high, so it's those three things mostly. And what what activates the life shortening proteins like mTOR that's present in 100% of invasive cancers and promotes diabetes, what activates that is sugar and animal protein and excess calories, right? right. Excess calories, especially sugar and animal protein, shorten your life. Moderate caloric restriction with eating more colorful plants with exercise lengthens your life. You got. You just explained. That's the whole. Mo that's the major things right there. Let's have a look. This one, Carmela. Um, she's asking whether taurine, is, would, whether you would recommend taurine as a supplement to take. Well, some people on vegan diets can be low in taurine, but it's the majority of people are not. So the okay. the answer is I don't know. It's some people would benefit from taurine supplements, and most of the people don't need it. But yeah, it could be possibly that some people on vegan diets might be low in taurine because it's one of the limiting amino acids, but it's not um, something that people should worry about in general. You know what I mean? Sure, sure. Okay. Um, now, another question. Um, the question is kind of, some questions start with a statement, so I'll, I'll read it verbatim. <laughs> I've heard that saturated fat doesn't cause heart disease, and sugar does. So what's wrong with butter? <laughs> yeah so sugar causes yeah yeah that's more marketing hype in other words just because we found that sugar causes heart disease yes. doesn't mean that saturated fat doesn't cause heart disease they both cause heart disease yes. and i have a book about that i have a book i wrote called the end of heart disease and that book goes into all the studies that when people switch for the reason people can make that claim is when people switch from a diet that contain more meats and, and fats 
and they switched to a diet that was higher in carbohydrates, when the carbohydrates came from white rice and from sugar and high glycemic carbohydrates like white bread and white rice, we didn't see heart disease go down. But when the carbohydrates came from beans and vegetables, the heart disease melted away. So what I'm so it's really it's not that saturated fat is okay. It's just that it's just that high glycemic carbohydrates are just as bad. Saturated fat we know blocks insulin receptors. Saturated fat we know increases risk of epithelial and squamous cell carcinomas. Saturated fat we know raises cholesterol, and it is true. And you can't say butter and and as high saturated fat animal products don't increase risk of heart disease and cancer, they absolutely definitively do. Because you don't just eat saturated fat anyway. You eat the animal product that has saturated fat in it. And the animal product as a whole has other factors that also increase risk of death. And plus those foods are, have no redeeming qualities. They're not high in fiber and phytochemicals. It's just a completely misconstrued, and it shows you how we've confused people so much about they have to recognize that the healthiest foods called produce eat mostly produce a meal isn't a meal without meat in china i've noticed it more maybe because i turned to vegetarianism here in, here in china but um even if you get a, a salad they'd have little flakes of meat in there or meat mince mixed in with it it's so hard to get just veg vegetables and people associate uh, vegetarian dishes as being cheaper, lower quality, um, and not so, not as tasty. That's very very sad, isn't it? Uh, well, <laughs> we have a lot of learning to do. And you know, in our country, in, in the United States, people don't eat just a little bit of meat on a salad or in a dish or in a soup. No. They eat tons. They eat a big sixteen ounce piece of meat. They eat a giant, eat a whole quarter of a chicken. They eat a whole, you know, they, in other words, they're eating huge amounts of this stuff and they're committing suicide with these animal products. You know, if you eat mostly vegetables and you had an ounce cut up as a condiment to flavor, it wouldn't be so bad in a, in a, whole, in a diet. In other words, what I'm saying right now, if your diet is largely vegetables and you used an ounce of an animal product to flavor a big vegetable dish for the day, it's not the same thing as eating a six, an eight ounce or 16 ounce piece of steak. You know what I'm saying? So we're, oh. it's all a matter of how much you eat and the more you eat, the more danger it gets. The more you drink alcohol, the worse it is. And the more you smoke cigarettes, the more cigarettes you smoke, the worse it gets. Yeah. You know what I mean? So maybe they can just, so people that can't give it up, can you recognize that larger amounts are dangerous and the goal is to still to eat 90% of your diet from produce and cut your animal product down radically, even if you don't eliminate it. Right, right. Okay, um, a question from um, Irene uh, Gomolka. Um, do you recommend filtered or distilled water or some other type of water as part of your healthy uh, daily? Right, I recommend clean water. So the water, whatever you would need to get it clean, if it's purification systems or distillation systems, whatever you have available to keep the water clean, and we don't want to drink water that's contaminated or dirty. But I don't care what method you use to get it clean. Okay. Okay. The stored water would be um, a little bit uh, deficient in uh, nutrients, I guess, and, and reverse osmosis to a much greater degree. Do you think... We don't need to get nutrients in our water. We just need to keep it clean as possible. We get all the nutrients and minerals we need from the food we eat. Water does not have to be a source of minerals. We don't need anything in our water. It could be pure water. Because look, when you're eating a healthy diet and you're not having salt, you don't need to drink as much water anyway. It's these high salt, low nutrient diets that we that are dried out and make people have to over drink water like crazy. And they wash away the nutrients because they're over drinking water. Right. We should be eating foods that are naturally eating a low sodium diet with high water content foods. And we don't need to drink a huge amount of water. And our water should be clean. Our water doesn't have to be a source of minerals. The mineral content of water is insignificant anyway. Okay. And volumes, I guess that's right. The... Um do you add salt to any of your foods? And do you recommend people? No, do, do not. I do not add any salt to my food at all. I just eat the natural foods as nature intended them to be. And that way I don't have to worry about ever developing high blood pressure and ever having a stroke. Okay. Now, one of the, th uh, one of the things which people are addicted to is, of course, sugar. And there are alternatives 
artificial sweeteners which people can take to substitute for their cravings is this, what's your what's your thoughts it, on that it? perpetuates the cravings if you start to substitute artificial sweeteners for sugar then you're just perpetuating cravings in your brain that make you want to all constantly want to have sweets yeah. <laughs> That's right, that's right. And I can tell you you're really passionate about this because you didn't let me finish the question, but the question was, Stevia, what's your, what's your views on that? Now, we're talking about cases where people are having difficulty weaning themselves off sugar. It takes a while, it takes a long time. And life is for living, not for suffering. And it's, quite a, it's a suffering period between you know, going cold turkey on sugar and then becoming accustomed to it. So can someone use Stevia as a substitute? You, you kind of inserted a little personal opinion in there. In other words, what I'm saying is that it's your opinion that when you're coming off and when you have an addict, a sugar addict, yes. it's better to have them gradually come off their sugar yes. than to cold turkey it and just suffer for a few days and then be free of that addiction for a long time. It's and true. I, don't know, I don't know that's if what you're saying is true okay. because many, many people do better because if you keep having the stevia and keep having the sweeteners in there, yes. they keep craving to have sugars and you never, it's like saying, is it easier to quit smoking? Just go off the cigarette completely? Yes. Or should we give people an e-cigarette? Or should we give them, you know, cut back on cigarettes first to not make it so hard for them? But a lot of times a little bit of smoking makes them want to have more and it makes it harder for them to quit. Okay. By putting them in an environment with no cocaine and no cigarettes, Sure, it might be a little bit uncomfortable for a couple of days, but it makes it easier in the long run. And it eventually makes them get rid of their addictions better. So I'm not sure I agree with what you're thinking that um, there may be, so there may be some individuals that might do better making baby steps towards improvement. Because yes. if they have to do this all at once, they reject the whole thing. Yes. So there are some individuals you have to do that, and this is an art. But there are a lot of people that need to, cult, need to go 100% with both feet in and cut out all the sweeteners and all the stevia and just so they don't keep wanting to overeat food because they can't get rid of their desire to keep eating too much calories with those sweeteners on them and you never will get those taste buds strong enough so you enjoy the natural flavor in a wild blueberry or strawberry. You enjoy the, all the flavor of romaine lettuce or avo you know, avocado or cashew nut. These things have, there are natural flavors that you deaden with your continual overstimulation of your sweet tooth. And even the natural sweeteners like stevia that's so concentrated can still perpetuate that deadening of the taste buds that makes you no longer appreciate natural foods. I prefer people to come into my retreat and just to eat the foods I'm serving them whether they like it or not. <laughs> and they'll say, just eat the food whether you like it or not. And all of a sudden you see in a couple of weeks they start to love it because their taste buds got so much stronger. Yes. If you started giving them the stevia and the salt substitutes and the sugar substitutes and this and that, they would keep going on not liking the food. They'd never get their own taste buds to get strong. Do you follow me? We're, 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 we've uh, got a very, very passionate expert with us this week. Now, it was a bit of a leader creature. I actually fully agree with you. I don't believe there's a halfway. I think you've either got to do it or you don't. If you've got to, especially with a, um, a major health reason for um, changing That's lifestyle. Great. You either do it or you don't. And right. it's up to the person I <laughs> side with you. But hey, I like to do some fishing sometimes. Um, so um, let's, uh, let's make sure I've got all the questions that I've got to ask. Asked. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, I have. Now, that, um, before we finish, I'd like you to give the audience, I know time flies when you're having fun. When you, um, what, what what, I'll give you one sentence. Well, I won't interrupt you. One sentence where the best advice you can give people that are watching us and thinking, gosh, you know, um, I don't want to do it because I like eating snacks. And they're not going to. You know, people seem to think they're invincible. But what, what single piece of advice would you give as to summarize what we've, what we've talked about now? Well, um, what I'm saying here tonight is that the diet style that's most effective at extend, slowing aging and extending human lifespan is also the most therapeutically effective for reversing disease, like reversing autoimmune conditions like psoriasis or getting lower people's blood pressure 
or getting rid of their diabetes or reversing heart disease. The same diet that makes you so aging and live longer is gonna reverse people's illnesses when they get sick. So that's number one. And I want, and nobody should real, and they, people have to know that they don't have to be sick, that they don't have to suffer. They don't have to be fearful, they can control their health destiny. And if you, don't, if you, don't, if you want to have happen to you what happens to other people, and you want to get cancer and heart disease and strokes and be, get diabetes, you can do that. You know, it's a, but if you want to have great health, it's fun, it's exciting, and it's great living without fear. And this is a blessing that we can have great health using modern food technology, you know, using this modern nutritional science. So I think it's called a no-brainer to do this myself. You know, but we're not going to convince everybody. It's up to you individually. Yeah. No argument. No argument at all. I fully agree. And it's, it's really... Um, the whole summer program that we that um, this program is it's all about empowerment and this is precisely what you're doing now just um, you're saying to people they've got the power to do make big changes in their life not giving not passing their health issues to health professionals necessarily but taking control of your own life and through natural means resolving health issues and living longer living happier and um, hmm, doing, doing things the old fashioned way. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Hey, thank you so much for your time. Okay. You've, you. you've taught us a lot. I, I've really enjoyed this talk too. I, I really enjoy the people that we have on that are very, very passionate. They're the, they're the sort of people that will interrupt me. They'll, um, they'll take the bait every time. <laughs> I've loved it. I've really enjoyed it. So thank you again. Well, you're welcome. And best of health to, to you and, of course, all the listeners here tonight. I'm wishing everybody much great health and much happiness always. Thank you, Joel. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everybody.